Thanks so much, Fraser, and um, thank you to HSS for inviting me here today. I'm very excited to be back speaking to a room of people. Um, and I'm going to start just by asking everybody to take a minute and think of the last time they were persuaded of something. So the chances are that you followed a process a little bit like this. This comes from one of the, the kind of godfathers of psychology of communications and persuasion, Caldini. He's a campaigns guru and the two elements of his breakdown of persuasion that I'm going to focus on today are consensus and consistency. The idea here is that people's actions are based on their beliefs. So if you can get someone to agree with something, the chances are that it will follow that they'll act in a consistent way and take actions that match that belief. So there's been a lot of dodgy kind of experiments done in the names of com psychology. And this is not one that I'm advocating that anybody does uh, t tonight, Friday night. St Andrew's Day holiday as well, I believe. But do Devotees of Caldini have suggested that if you can get someone to agree at the beginning of a night that they're a bit of a rule breaker, you massively increase the chances that by the end of the night they'll be dancing on the table. <laughs> this is often called the lowest point of agreement. If you find this common entry point to what somebody believes and what they're prepared to agree with, you'll massively increase the chances that bigger actions will follow. So my own example is not dancing on the table at the end of the night, you'll be pleased to know. But my children persuaded me to buy a soda stream on the basis that plastic pollution, I agree, believe, is a problem. So as the champions of the assisted dying movement, and we are a movement, a social movement, our challenge is to persuade people in power to vote for Liam's bill to persuade them to believe in the common point of agreement and take actions that then match that belief. And my proposition for that point of agreement is that for some dying people, we are getting death and dying very badly wrong. Bad deaths do occur. Amanda mentioned that being a clairvoyant isn't in the job description. And Liam's also talked about what led him to becoming a Liberal Democrat. The biggest way, that, the most likely way to predict the future is by looking at what happened in the past. And I'm going to look very, very quickly at one of the greatest liberal reforms of our time, and that's the 1967 Abortion Act. The point of agreement that was reached was that the law was unsafe and it was failing women. The evidence shows in the 10 years before the Abortion Act was introduced that abortion became the biggest cause of maternal death in the UK, with 50 to 60 women dying a year and hundreds more, thousands more, hospitalised with septicemia. The consensus was the law does not work, the law is failing women. So how do we get to that same point of agreement with assisted dying? I would argue it's with compelling evidence, with facts and powerful personal testimony. If we look now at assisted dying, this slide here gives us an idea of the total number of dying people who've been directly affected by the UK's blanket ban on assisted dying. And across the UK, that number is 9,500 to 13,500. If we break that down, 50 people travel to Switzerland each year for an assisted death. Between 3,000 and 6,500 people attempt to end their own lives when they have a terminal illness. Between 300 and 650 people succeed in ending their own lives when they have a terminal illness. And 6,400 people will suffer pain in the last three months of life 
even with the very best, even if they had gold standard hospice level palliative care. I'm so sorry that I've been unable to get Scotland statistics on some of these measures. I know we've got some expert researchers and some social researchers in the room, and if they would allow me this bit of um, quite bad behaviour, what we could do to give us a bit of an indication is divide those numbers by 10. And if so, we'd be looking at between 950 to 1,350 Scots a year who are being failed by the current blanket ban on assisted dying. The stat that we do have out of these the Office of Health Economics did some modelling for a Dignity in Dying report that I'll come on to mention, The Inescapable Truth of It Dying. And they looked at if every single person had access to gold standard to hospice level palliative care, how many people would reach the limits of those care, that care, how many people would continue to suffer as they die. And the figure they gave us would be that 11 Scots a week would continue to suffer and have a painful death even with universal excellent palliative care. 11 Scots a week, that's 11 too many. So the numbers make a very clear case and they form the basis of the consensus. The current law doesn't work and it's failing dying people. The very same as the abortion situation, the ban on abortion, the law didn't work and it was failing women. Some dying people will face a bad death and suffer as they die, and the law is unsafe. None of the current options, Switzerland, starvation, suicide or suffering, are in any way acceptable alternatives to a safe and compassionate law. Amanda mentioned that what the opposition are actually for is unregulated assisted dying, not a ban on assisted dying. And I think forcing people to go underground to take matters into their own hands or go overseas, the lack of transparency, the question I would like to pose back to our opponents is how does this lack of transparency protect dying people? And the answer is it doesn't. I mentioned the research reports. Dignity and Dying have three research reports which make this case and set out the consensus that the current law we have is a law that doesn't work and is failing dying people. These reports are the true cost, and that's the true cost of going to Switzerland, the inescapable truth about dying in Scotland, and last resorts. Last Resorts tells the story of dying people who take or attempt to take their own life in order to avoid a painful death. Taken together, these three reports, and there's copies of them up in the, the break room and at reception for anybody who would like to take any away, they set out a very powerful call to action. The true cost shows that not only do people need to have the funds available to go to Switzerland, putting very much a class inequality and social injustice at the heart of our system, they need to also be fit enough and well enough to travel and potentially take weeks or months off their life in order to go and die in a country away from their family and friends, away from their own health and social care support workers. Of the people I know who have gone to Switzerland and who have died in Switzerland. It's absolutely not in any way an easy option and their final weeks and months are racked with worry. Will they make it there okay? Will they be stopped at the airport? How will it be for their loved ones going with them and coming back alone? Will their loved ones face any threat of prosecution? Will there be any investigation? That's a complete postcode lottery, by the way. As to whether they'll get there or not, the true cost of going to Switzerland sort of really breaks down how this postcode lottery works. Somebody's doctor faxed their medical records because you need to have your full set of medical records to be accepted by clinics such as Dignitas. So somebody's doctor just faxed them straight over, not a problem, part of the job. Somebody else has refused and called social services. And until you're in that position, you don't know, you don't know which one of those you're going to get.
the way that going to Switzerland for an assisted death was described to me most memorably was like it was part becoming it was like becoming a member of a sad and secret society and that secrecy and the stigma involved not being able to tell people what somebody's plans are not being able to tell people how someone that they love died reinforces a very complex and very particularly cruel grief and bereavement the inescapable truth about dying is one of the most harrowing things I've ever read in my life and I will give a content warning now to anybody who's thinking about taking a copy away with them. I um, speak to people who go through bad deaths, who've witnessed bad deaths for, you know, d daily in this job and I had to take several breaks and pauses when I was reading that document because the suffering that it describes is is, is in many cases beyond the realm of human comprehension. As well as people who were dying, those who'd witnessed bad deaths, we also spoke to doctors and palliative care consultants for that report. And there's a really striking quote where a palliative care consultant says of a particular patient's death, it was utter degradation. And as a medical practitioner, I was humiliated. This was the best we had to offer. And last resort, again, another content warning. Um, it tells incredibly powerful testimonies of people who have attempted to take their own life or who have taken their own life in order to avoid a painful death. In each of these reports, we tell hard truths and we tell true stories. And the effect of those two powerful elements combined give us the basis of this consensus, the consensus we need to take with us as we leave the room today. The current law is not working. It needs to change. We, we tell true stories, and I know Josh is going to be um, speaking about his story with his, his lovely grandmother Mary later, and we saw um, this beautiful video earlier so I'm not going to say too much about any of the personal stories that we work with I'm sure many of you have one yourself just to say I'm absolutely grateful to every single person who stands up and speaks out and who furthers this movement they tell intensely personal experiences in order to bring about political change and we know from our discussions within parliament with MSPs who voted against previous bills, who are now saying, I'm really thinking about this, give me the right bill and I'll do it. And what's opened the door, what's taken them to that position, has been powerful personal testimony that when they hear, they don't have a compelling response back to. And resorting to vague and hypothetical fears isn't enough in the face of actual and real and genuine personal experience happening on their doorstep. The personal is indeed political. So, uh, Amanda also mentioned um, Australia in her talk in New South Wales, which is the last state to legalise assisted dying, Australia has five out of six states which have um, legal access to assisted dying. And yesterday, the bill passed the lower house, um, which is a sort of our equivalent of stage one. It's now on its way to the upper house. And the wonderful campaign and organisation, our sister organisation, Go Gentle, have been really instrumental in leading the campaign in all of those uh, Australian states. Go Gentle was founded by um, a, a wonderful man, a, a TV broadcaster and personality, Andrew Denton. And Andrew is a campaigner to his heart, his heart and bones. He could write his own book about how to persuade and influence people. So I hit him up for some advice um, just as we were launching Liam's bill. I said, Andrew, five out of six states, how did you do it? And there were two pieces of gold uh, that I think we can bring very much to the process of securing law change in Scotland. And one of those was 
this is won or lost before it hits the floor of Parliament. The time to persuade those you need to persuade is now. And secondly, and I'm going to exempt present company here, I'm sure this does not go for all politicians, but the other thing that Andrew said was that politicians don't always vote on what they think. They often vote on what they think other people think. So on that point, I'm going to go to another low point of consensus, point of agreement. Only 6% of Scots believe that the current law works well. 6%. So, I'm not going to take up too much more of your time. The reports are available for you. Please take them. If, as the movement of, for compassionate assisted dying, we are the movement for the majority, and if now is our time, what can we do to make the most of it, to go forth from today? We've already heard you can fill out the consultation open until the 22nd of December. Um, please go on the Parliament website if you've not done so already and do that. But we can pick our targets, those people in power who need to be persuaded that this current law, the law we have now, is failing the very people it's meant to serve. We build consensus with them that the law is not working. We make the case. Switzerland, starvation, suicide and suffering are not the answer. Change is. We use the evidence and we tell those stories. And in many cases, we tell our own stories. This is the right bill at the right time. It's a chance we've got to get it right for dying Scots and we need to take it. So please go forward. Um, advance until apprehended. Thank you. <laughs>